Questions and comments. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Fisheries and Oceans. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank uh, my Honourable Friend for his speech. I agree with him in the fact that this place is the voice of Canadians. In fact, I was so interested in what was going on with the Fisheries Act that I went back to uh, the lengthy debate that happened in 2012 around uh, the fi changes of the Fisheries Act the last government made. But of course, there wasn't very much debate because it was made as part of an omnibus budget bill that included all kinds of other things. And so, I guess the one comment that I'll take exception to, and the one thing that I'd like the Honourable Member to have a chance to address, he said that these are unnecessary amendments. But Mr. Speaker, we went across Canada. The Fisheries and Oceans Committee reviewed those changes that happened in 2012, and they came up with 32 recommendations, all of which were put into this Act. In fact, there are hundreds of meetings coast to coast to coast, 2,163 online submissions, 5,438 ebook questionnaires, 200 plus Indigenous group submissions. It sounds like the voice of Canadians says that this act can be improved. Why is he saying that these are unnecessary amendments? Honourable Member for Caribou, Prince George. Uh, Mr. Speaker, um, I didn't say they're uh, unnecessary amendments. My opening line was geared to elicit a response from them. We said this was an unnecessary piece of legislation because in our previous government, we actually created a piece of legislation that A, was uh, easier for uh, DFO officials to enforce. It was easier for uh, industry and conservation groups to actually build more fish, create more fish. Mr. Speaker, and protect him at the same time, Mr. Speaker. Let's, let, me, let me go back to 2015, where the Prime Minister said under his government, the Harper ways of the ominous bills, uh, ominous bills were, were gone. Mr. Speaker, just before us, just before we had a 400-page bill that we were debating. Mr. Speaker, they shut our debate. They still passed their, put through these ominous bills. Uh, I, I, I just think, Mr. Speaker, this is another example of uh, broken promises by this government. Thank you. Questions and comments? Uh, the Honourable Member for Fleetwood Port Kells. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, I sit with the gentleman on uh, fisheries and oceans. I thought that uh, we did an awfully good job on C-68 and, you know, went back and forth. We discussed amendments. Uh, we accepted some of each other's and worked, worked it right through. What we were fixing were years of neglect and cuts. Cuts to science. Yes, it was easy for DFO to, uh, to administer the, the old act because they, they gutted DFO's uh, ability to do anything by cutting them back. And it's pretty easy to, you know, follow the rules when there's only a few rules. And I want to ask the member if he remembers the testimony that we heard from First Nations reflecting upon the fact that back in 2012-2013 it was very clear that the only voices that the Conservatives heard in that consultation were the voices of industry, which showed up in full measure in the bill that they produced. And maybe he can recall what we heard from the Indigenous people who felt totally shut out by that earlier process. Well, member for Caribou, Prince George. Mr. Speaker, if the Honourable Colleague wants to talk cuts, let's talk about the $91 million that they're cutting out of the departmental plan, or let's talk about uh, the announcement that they were cutting the Salmon Enhancement Program in, in British Columbia, the program that has educated 40,000 students all across British Columbia and also helped uh, create more of our iconic species salmon and helped conservation uh, groups like Spruce City Wildlife in my group. They announced that. They announced that they were going to do some uh, small closures of some, uh, some bases and, and Ms. Mr. Speaker, it was the pressure of the grassroots, it was the pressure of the opposition right across the bench that got them to reverse those charges or those uh, decisions and actually reinvest in that iconic program, the Salmon Enhancement Program. I ta I'll take no question from that gentleman or no lesson from that gentleman there. We do great work on the committee, but he's just talking liberal talking points right now. Thank you. It's uh, time just for one more short question. I'll take one from the Honourable Member for Carlton Trail, Eagle Creek. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, and I do want to thank my colleague for his comments here this evening and for the work 
that he does as our shadow minister for fisheries and oceans. I, I concur with him that uh, we had a very similar experience in the uh, Transportation Committee. Not a single witness could provide an example where the changes that were made to the MPA um, put in by the previous Conservative government had had a negative effect on waterways. In fact, at the committee when the Minister of Transportation was asked if he could provide a single example, he simply refused to until he was compelled to answer. And then he gave an answer that actually proved that the MPA that was put in in 2012 was actually working. I'm wondering if uh, you had a similar experience uh, during your study in committee. The Honourable Member for uh, Caribou Prince George, a short response, please. Absolutely. Well, M Mr. Speaker, the short response is yes. But, Mr. Speaker, the, um, it, it is very interesting when we have the department uh, uh, officials before us. And the one thing that I do really respect my honourable colleague that was up just previously from the government side is we do great work at the Fisheries Committee when we put away our partisan uh, jabs and we put away our talking points, Mr. Speaker, and whether it is a government side that is challenging the department officials. Mr. Speaker, we have had department officials, heads of departments that are standing before us, appearing before us, that can't tell us uh, uh, critical information of their own department. They're managers of this. They're tasked to manage it, and they haven't been, Madam or Mr. Speaker. Resuming debate, the Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Fisheries and Oceans. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Let me start by uh, thanking my Honourable Friend for his speech. So it was uh, nice, to, especially on these late nights, to be debating a, a fellow British Columbia. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to rise today in support of the amendments to the Fisheries Act. For far too long, we've taken our oceans for granted. This was demonstrated when, in 2012, the previous government decided to change the habitat protections without the support of or proper engagement with Indigenous peoples, fishers and anglers, scientists, conservation groups, coastal communities, nor the broader Canadian public. By comparison, our government has listened to and worked with all Canadians and has encouraged everyone to be a part of this process. This bill is the result of that good work. Bill C-68 has several key themes. Partnership with Indigenous peoples, supporting planning and integrated management, enhancing regulation and enforcement, improving partnership and collaboration, and monitoring and reporting back to Canadians. During their review of Bill C-68, my colleagues in committee heard from many expert witnesses from right across the country. I would like to take this time to talk about what they heard and the concrete steps they proposed to help improve the legislation even further for the benefit of Canadians and the benefit of future generations. From the environmental NGO community, members across the aisle, the committee heard about the importance of water flow for fish habitat and the government supported the associated amendments put forward in committee, and we believe they will contribute to the effective management of fish habitat. The committee also heard from industry groups seeking amendments to the rules proposed for the processing applications for habitat authorizations during the transition from the current legislation. In response, the committee adopted an amendment to provide for clearer transition provisions. Mr. Speaker, the committee also heard about strengthening the federal government's legal obligations when major fish stocks are in trouble. That is why the committee proposed the inclusion of requirements under the legislation that the minister sustainably manage or rebuild fish stocks that are prescribed in regulations. Legislation will require that when exceptions are made for environmental or socioeconomic reasons, that Canadians will be informed and provided for a rationale for those decisions. As with every decision, our aim is to sustainably manage fisheries resources for the long-term benefit of all Canadians. I want to take this opportunity to thank the committee for their contributions to Bill C-68. Their previous study engaged Canadians right across the country and led to 32 recommendations, all of which are included in this legislation. Their further work after second reading has again contributed significantly to this bill and Canadians will surely benefit from their diligence and their hard work. This bill includes the reintroduction of the prohibition against the harmful alteration, disruption or destruction of fish habitat, otherwise known as the HAD provisions, as well as the prohibition against the death of fish by means other than fishing. There are measures to allow for the better management of large and small projects that may be harmful to fish or fish ha habitat through a new permitting program for big projects and codes of practice for smaller projects. These amendments will enable the regulatory authorities 
that will allow for establishing a list of designated projects comprised of works, undertakings, and activities for which a permit will always be required. Our goal is to streamline processes and provide greater certainty while protecting the environment. And we've engaged with Indigenous peoples, provinces and territories, other stakeholders, to make sure that we capture the right kind of project under this designated project list. Habitat loss and degradation, changes to fish passage and flow, are all contributing to the decline of freshwater and marine fish habitats in Canada. It is imperative that Canada restores degraded fish habitats. That is why amendments to the Fisheries Act include consideration of restoration as part of project decision making. One message that we heard clearly when we engaged Canadians in developing this bill was that much of the public trust in government was lost through the 2012 changes. Throughout the review of the changes to the Fisheries Act, a common message received was the need for improved access to information on the government's activities related to the protection of fish and fish habitat, as well as project decisions and further information. We listened and we introduced amendments to establish a public registry, which will enable transparency and open access. This registry will allow Canadians to see whether their government is meeting its obligations and hold us all accountable for federal decision-making with regards to the protection of marine ecosystems. The new considerations under the amendments to the Fisheries Act seek to more clearly guide the responsibility of the Minister of Fisheries, Oceans and the Canadian Coast Guard when making decisions. The addition of new purpose and consideration provisions provide a framework for the proper management and control of fisheries and for the conservation and protection of fish and fish habitat, including by preventing pollution. As we all know, fisheries resources and aquatic habitats have important social, cultural and economic significance for many Indigenous peoples. Respect for the rights of Indigenous peoples of Canada, as well as taking into account their unique interests and aspirations in fisheries, Related economic opportunities and the protection of fish and fish habitat is one way we are showing our commitment to renewing relationships with Indigenous peoples. Amendments to the Fisheries Act include ministerial authority to make regulations to establish long-term spatial restrictions to fishing activities under the Act, specifically for the purposes of conserving and protecting marine biodiversity and supporting our international commitment to protect at least 10 percent of our marine and coastal areas by 2020. Mr. Speaker, as I mentioned earlier, our government has reached out to Canadians in developing this bill. We listened to the Commissioner of the Environment, Sustainable Development, and the Standing Committee of Fisheries and Oceans and provided direction for the restoration and recovery of fish habitat and stocks. We listened to environmental groups and adopted measures aimed at rebuilding depleted fish stocks by requiring decisions affected a stock in the critical zone to consider whether there are measures in place aimed at rebuilding the stock and when habitat degradation is a factor in the decline of the stock, whether there are measures in place to restore this habitat. We have presented in, the, in this bill the appropriate safeguards to sustain the health of our oceans and fisheries for our future generations. Mr. Speaker, we've also heard from Canadians on other important issues. We have proposed amendments to the Fisheries Act that would prohibit fishing for cetacean whales uh, when the intent is to take it into captivity unless circumstances so require, such as when the cetacean is injured, in distress, or in need of care. Over 72,000 Canadians make their living directly from fishing and fishing-related activities. Many are middle-class, self-employed, inshore harvesters. The Minister has made it clear on his commitment to make inshore independent uh, more effective. Amendments speak to specific authority in the Fisheries, Ship Fisheries Act rather than policy to develop regulations supporting the independence of the inshore commercial license holders and will enshrine into legislation the ability to make regulations regarding the owner-operator and fleet separation policies in Atlantic Canada and Quebec. By restoring the loss protections, providing these new modern safeguards, the government is delivering on its promise as set out in the mandate letter from the Prime Minister to the Minister of Fisheries Oceans and the Canadian Coast Guard. Since introduction of this bill, we have heard support from a broad range of Canadians for these amendments, which will return Canada to the forefront of protection of our rivers and coasts and fish for generations to come. I urge all honourable members on both sides of this House to join with me in supporting this bill. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Questions and comments? The honourable member for Caribou, Prince George. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I, I, I wanted to um, rise uh, 
and apologize to the House for my excitement. Uh, I am excited when we're talking about C-68 and anything to do with, with fisheries, but um, as our honourable colleague was, uh, was speaking, um, uh, a uh, player that I coached for uh, in, in my community of Prince George, uh, Brett Connolly, uh, and his Washington Capitals uh, just won the uh, Stanley Cup. So very, uh, very happy for one of our players. He's a great kid, and um, Mr. Speaker, through you, I'm just wondering if uh, I may not get a chance to, to wish him congratulations on this tour, if our honourable colleagues would join me in actually wishing uh, Brett Connolly and the Washington Capitals congratulations uh, uh, here. So, thank you. The Honourable uh, Prime Minister Secretary. Uh, well, my congratulations to any Capitals fans that are out there. Of course, today we're discussing Bill C-68. Uh, you know, it's uh, it's interesting. For the last, I would say, month or so, I've been asking, I've been answering in this house these unsubstantiated claims on these surf climate issues. And in fact, the member opposite found a way to bring it up in a previous bill we were debating just five, ten, fifteen minutes ago. I understand why the Conservative government doesn't want to talk about the improvements that we're making. Sorry, the previous Conservatives, the Conservatives across the way don't want to talk about the improvements that we're making to the Fisheries Act because this is broadly supported by Canadians. And the reason it's bought broadly supported by Canadians, Mr. Speaker, is because we consulted broadly from coast to coast to coast. Canadians are proud of the fact that we're restoring protections, that we're installing modern safeguards, that we're taking steps to bring in hundreds of thousands of square kilometres of new marine protections to make sure that those 72,000 jobs, those middle-class jobs that are provided in the fish, fishing industry right across this country, are going to grow. And maybe 100,000 jobs or 150,000 jobs, Mr. Speaker. That's what this government is focused on, and that's what we'll continue to focus on. Questions and comments? The Honourable Member for Victoria. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I'd like to thank the Parliamentary Secretary for his speech. and. Uh, I, I salute the bill because for the first time in 150 years it recognizes, as he mentioned, the importance of rebuilding um, overfished stocks by creating a legal duty to develop plans, uh, uh, etc. But I understand that that will be left to the regulations. And while I understand that that's often useful to provide more detail, I wonder if he shares with me a concern that it may never come to pass if those regulations are never enacted. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Fisheries and Oceans. Well, uh, Mr. Speaker, I, I thank the member opposite for the question. The member from Victoria and I have had a chance to work together on a number of issues. With another British Columbian. It seems to be an all British Columbian cast so far, Mr. Speaker. Uh, oh, I, I, I expect we'll hear from other parts of the country. Um, yeah, when it comes to uh, the uh, introduction of these measures within the Fisheries Act uh, to enable the rebuilding of fish stocks, I think this is absolutely critical. I mean, any person that looks at what has happened to fish stocks on any coast, on almost any measure, we have seen uh, tremendous declines. In fact, when we look at uh, the goalposts that we set, where do we set the bar for critical zone? Where do we set the bar for healthy zone? I know that our government, for the first time, isn't just focused on the protection of species. We are interested in the restoration of species and the restoration of our marine environment. And anybody that reads the amendments, you will see all the way through every segment of this legislation, it's built on the restoration, restoring our fish stocks to traditional levels of abundance for the economic, social, and cultural success of our, uh, community, our uh, coastal communities, Mr. Speaker. Questions and comments? Take a short question from the Honourable Member for Caribou, Prince George. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, um, our Honourable colleague uh, uh, mentioned the, the unsubstantiated uh, surf clam allegations. Mr. Speaker, here's the facts. And these are substantiated through court documents, Mr. Speaker. The Minister, uh, his most senior official, also substantiated this that the minister, it was his decision to award a lucrative surf clam quota to a sitting Liberal MP's brother, uh, Mr. Speaker, and they like to say that it was all about reconciliation. Mr. Speaker, the minister's most senior official confirmed that they had the least amount of Indigenous participation. The Liberal Premier of Newfoundland, the Liberal Fisheries Minister of Newfoundland said this has, has nothing to do with reconciliation. Mr. Speaker, I offer to you this. 
that the claim that our honourable colleague just made about unsubstantiated uh, facts, the ethics commissioner has investigated. It has been uh, indeed substantiated. And uh, with that, Mr. Speaker, I'll sit. Well, Parliamentary Secretary. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, this bill, the Fishery, uh, Fisheries Act, C-68, is going to restore lost protections, including the HAD protections. And it's actually going to strengthen the role of Indigenous communities. Uh, when I was first made the Parliamentary Secretary uh, for Fisheries and Oceans of the Canadian Coast Guard, one of the things that I did in my first summer was make sure that I got out and visited as many Indigenous communities as I could get to. It, it, most times, Indigenous communities that hadn't had a Parliamentary Secretary, a Minister of Fisheries and Oceans, visit for maybe a generation, two generations, if at all. And I can tell you that this bill, this legislation, strengthens the role of Indigenous communities. It provides an increased role in decision-making, policy-making, and in monitoring. Uh, it goes right alongside our investments in Indigenous communities, including $250 million to get more Indigenous uh, communities access to the fisheries. That's going to cause generational changes that are going to be very positive for all Canadians, especially Indigenous communities, Mr. Speaker. Resuming debate, uh, the Honourable Member for Victoria. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I'm also pleased to be one of uh, the British Columbians to which my friend referred. It seems this is a fully British Columbian night, um, and I'm proud to uh, speak in support of Bill C-68, and I want to salute initially the enormous work and contribution made by our fisheries critic, the Honourable Member for Port Moody, Coquitlam. Now, this bill goes a long way uh, to restore lost protections to the Fisheries Act and to introduce some modern safeguards. We believe that the legislation to restore HAD, uh, the Harmful Alteration, Disruption and, Dis uh, and Destruction, should have been introduced immediately following the last federal election, and then we could have been working together to modernize the Act from there. But we didn't see that from the Liberals, uh, and therefore modernization, I believe, we could have supported earlier, took a little bit of time to get in place, and we still, of course, have to enact it. I believe, that, therefore, that Bill C-68 C is, is okay. It could have been a lot better, for reasons I will explain. Mm -hmm. We introduced a series of, men, uh, of amendments to further strengthen the Fisheries Act, and although we were successful in seeing a couple of them passed, the ones that were defeated were also important for reasons I will come to. They would have strengthened the Act and had positive impacts on the health and sustainability of the fish population and their habitats for generations to come. Now, Bill C-68 restores much of what was lost for the changes made by the previous Conservative government in 2012 and introduces a number of positive provisions that we support. I'd like to talk about those before I come to some of the deficiencies in our view. Returning prohibitions against, as I said, harmful alteration, disruption and destruction of fish habitat is, is, is very, very important. And its applicability to all native fish and fisheries, as well as the prohibition on causing death of fish by other means than fishing, uh, were critical. And the fact that they were restored uh, is, is uh, an excellent feature of this bill. Secondly, including in the Act key provisions to strengthen how it's interpreted, I think are important purpose statements, along with the considerations for decision-making, and factors to inform the regulations that are going to be made under this, under this bill, uh, I think reflect key sustainability principles and are important as well. Thirdly, introducing provisions that address the rebuilding of depleted fish populations. We've talked about that earlier. Establishing a public registry to, the, uh, to support the assessment of so-called cumulative effects and to enhance transparency of decision-making. Strengthening provisions about ecologically significant areas that would move us from concept to action at last. And greater recognition of Indigenous rights and knowledge, particularly in light of the historic commitment of this House uh, in Bill C-262 to enshrine the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. The fact that there's going to be a statutorily mandated review every five years is also an important evergreen provision in this bill. And the bill was amended at committee, and one of the important amendments was the rebuilding of fish stocks section. 
because the core function of Fisheries and Oceans Canada is to manage our fish populations for the long term so we have a sustainable fishery. That's what this is all about, Mr. Speaker. And if they're not sustained it to sustainable levels, we won't be able to allocate the fish because we won't have the fish to allocate. So that's obviously important. And for the first time in 150 years, Bill C-68 recognizes the importance of rebuilding overfished stocks by creating a legal duty to develop plans aimed at moving stocks out of a critical zone. I think that's really important if, as I suggested earlier, regulations are actually made to do the, the work that's necessary. So these are welcome and long overdue, and I think we have to be sober about the state of our fisheries. Since 1970, over half of the biomass of our fisheries has disappeared, Mr. Speaker. By some estimates, only slightly more than one-third of our stocks are still considered healthy in this country. At least 21 of Canada's fish stocks are in the critical zone. And our fishing industry is precariously balanced on the continued abundance of only a few species. So these changes are important, and I salute the government for bringing them in. But I also have to flag some concerns. First, the minister can make exceptions to these requirements under certain conditions. We've got to make sure this discretion to exempt fish stocks does not get abused. Second, the law only applies to what are defined as, quote, major fish stocks, a phrase that will only be defined in future regulations. This creates a situation in which the government could circumvent the intent, the intent of the legislation by dragging its heels indefinitely in adding fish stocks to the regulations, thereby not requiring sustainable management measures or a rebuilding plan. These concerns were raised by my colleague at the Fisheries Committee, and I want to put them on the record again this evening. We introduced, the NDP introduced a number of amendments to Bill C-68, 22 of them to be exact. And a few of those improvements, as I say, I think are still valid. Firstly, the NDP submitted amendments to broaden the information base so that the public registry captures all projects and to ensure compensation for the residual harm to fish habitat caused by small or low-risk projects. Those amendments, unfortunately, Mr. Speaker, were defeated. Secondly, explicit protection for environmental flows and, fish, and fish passages was an issue, and we proposed amendments to strengthen those provisions so the free passage of fish and securing the environmental flows needed to protect fish and fish habitat would be in place. They were passed at the committee, I'm happy to say, and are part of the bill. I've already alluded, Mr. Speaker, to the recognition of Indigenous rights and knowledge. Um, the committee heard testimony, for example, from Matt Thomas of the Tsleil-Waututh Nation. New Democrats believe that reconcil reconciliation should be part of all legislation. Uh, and so uh, a true nation-to-nation -nation, uh, relationship with Canada's Indigenous peoples, cons uh, consistent with our Constitution, should be fully embraced and, re and reflected in the Fisheries Act. They were defeated, amendments along those lines. Fourthly, measures to increase transparency and accountability. The committee heard for, uh, uh, eloquent testimony from Lyndon Nolan of the West Coast Environmental Law Association, who testified about and made some great suggestions to increase transparency and accountability. The NDP made amendments to that effect, but they were all defeated. Finally, fifthly, provisions to apply owner, operator, and fleet separation policies to all of Canada's coasts was an idea proposed. Some of the most compelling testimony that we heard was from young fishers from the West Coast. And yet, the section in the Act talks about an independent inshore fishery uh, commercial fishery, as in, quote, Atlantic Canada and Quebec. Now, Canada's New Democrats fully support putting owner, operator, and fleet separation policies in the Fisheries Act, no problem. But we wonder, why didn't we do the same thing for our Pacific coast?
First Nations and independent fishermen on the West Coast want the same policy as in Atlantic Canada. New Democrats moved an amendment to open that door, but it was defeat the door was closed and the amendment was defeated. So, Mr. Speaker, I just want to make one further point before I conclude. We support the bill. We recognize the need to pr protect fish habitat, but I cannot let the opportunity to go by but talk about the impact that the, Ken the Kinder Morgan, now Government of Canada, tanker project will have and the possibility of it destroying, with a devastating spill of diluted bitumen, the essential habitat and aquatic ecosystems on which our fish depend. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Questions and comments. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Fisheries and Oceans. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank my member opposite for his comments. Uh, I'd like to ask him uh, his thoughts on enforcement. Uh, as he knows, the government is putting in more than $280 million uh, to go along with the, uh, the uh, amendment to the Fishery Act. Uh, a portion of that will go to enforcement. We heard previously that uh, the previous government felt that the reason that investigations into uh, illegal activities on our waters had gone down by 80 percent was because of how efficient they were. I thought it might have been because of the cuts in the 94 full-time enforcement positions that were taken out under the previous government, and I was wondering if my friend opposite had an opinion on that. The Honourable Member for Victoria. I think the, uh, my friend, the Parliamentary Secretary, raises an excellent point. $280 million is important. Enforcement is a critical aspect of any of these, of these sections, like take the uh, habitat alteration, destruction and uh, disruption section, which is so central to protecting fish habitat. Without fish habitat, we don't have fish. Logging and other industries on the West Coast in particular can, uh, can, can just devastate a stream on which salmon uh, depend for rearing, for example. And if we don't have people on the ground prepared to enforce that, we'll, ne we'll never have any benefit from those sections. So I couldn't agree more with the principle. But what it takes, Mr. Speaker, isn't money as much as it is political will. And neither this government nor the last government has shown itself ready to take the steps. Our environmental laws are replete with sections with large fines and great political commitments. And if you do the statistical analysis and see how often they're actually applied, the answer is pretty devastating. Rarely, if ever. Questions and comments? The Honourable Member for Kamloops, Thompson Caribou. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And as my colleague indicated, um, Last week, the Liberals stood up and voted for a piece of legislation, it was Bill 262, which was to implement the UN Declaration. In that bill, they made very specific commitments in terms of, especially around Article 19, where laws of general application would receive free prior and informed consent from First Nations. I would like to ask my colleague if he certainly believes that the Liberals, in turning down those amendments, were living up to the spirit of that vote that they placed in this House last week. And I do also want to note another member from British Columbia in the chamber tonight. Yeah. The Honourable Member for Victoria. I, I want to also recognize my friend from Kamloops for completing the cast of British Columbia characters tonight. Uh, we need a token non-British Columbian in this debate, Mr. Speaker. Perhaps you can arrange that later. Article 19, free prior and informed consent, yes. I think it's interesting that that bill that we passed probably does not have retroactive effect, but that doesn't mean that a bill like this, which is not yet enacted, shouldn't be read and interpreted and applied and implemented in the spirit of that historic declaration that this House made. That if properly applied, it could be as important as Section 35 of the Constitution Act of 1982 for Canada's Indigenous people. But it'll take an act of political will, it'll take a commitment to the spirit of reconciliation reflected in that document. I just hope the government puts its money and its enforcement action and its policy where our collective mouth is as we pass this important legislation. If we don't do it, it'll just be another bill on the shelf. Questions and comments. Can I say comment there? We'll take a short question from the Honourable Member for Kootenay, Columbia. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I just wanted to complete the BC roster this evening. Uh, I used to be the regional manager for Ministry of Environment for southeastern British Columbia, and 
When I first became regional manager, there were four federal fisheries officers working in the southeastern BC. The plan was to have 12, uh, six biologists, six enforcement officers. Uh, by the time, quite frankly, the Harper Conservative government were done, there were zero fisheries uh, employees of any kind in the southern interior. So I'd like to ask my colleague a bit about uh, whether he's hopeful that along with this bill, uh, new resources will be coming to British Columbia to better manage our fish in the interior as well. The Honourable Member for Victoria. Well, thank you, and I reflect, I, I'd like to uh, note again the member for Kootenai, Columbia. We've completed the geographic sweep of the province now, north, south, east and west, and a little urban as well. So I'm very proud to be here as a Canadian, but also as a British Columbian and participating in this debate. There's absolutely no doubt that the Harper government gutted the enforcement of the Fisheries Act. They, of course, took out the sections we talked about which were so central, and then they took the people away to actually apply it. So this government has enforcement money, but do they have the political will? Justice Cohen, in his historic rep report on the fisheries, talked extensively about the failure to enforce environmental legislation, such as the Fisheries Act, and I salute the government for putting money in place, but we really have to make sure that they're prepared to also put legal resources and other tools so we can get convictions and get the big fines that are contemplated and do the kind of planning work that's so necessary. Cumulative effects, restock building, re rebuilding the stocks and all of the other things that I think have promise in this bill but will only be implemented if money and political will are in place. Had to be about 40 minutes of steady debate there from British Columbians. That was good. Uh, 